Okay, and we are live once again. And tonight, we have a very emphatic, passionate discussion ahead. So, I was just on a call with a very interesting engineer who found himself in a position not unlike I think many of his peers, as I've been able to gather from the uh, micro consulting sessions that I've been putting together. So you might notice if you look at any of my videos or if you look at the banner on my YouTube page, there is a link offering help through Calendly and you can book a half hour, you can book an hour and you know, people book sessions and for me, it's not about the money. I charge to kind of keep the uh, tire kickers at bay. Um, but for me, it's about the data. Because um, I'm kind of thinking about how to get, you know, multiple ROIs. And the big thing is data. Like, what are the problems people are happening? What are the patterns? Where are the gaps in the market? How can I respond to that through videos, products, etc.? And... You know, I'm at a point now where I felt like I need to kind of talk about this. So as you'll see from the title, this all comes back to low code, no code. This is a drum that I have been beating for probably two years now. And uh, I think, you know, it's a tough concept for a lot of engineers because uh, it kind of First off, it equates to change, right? So engineers don't want, I mean, people in general are somewhat averse to change because change equals energy. It means that we're gonna have to learn something new. We're gonna have to take something that was once autopilot and make it um, conscious once again as we learn a new way of doing things. But let me kind of reiterate the story um, that came out of the call today with this guy. So. This guy is kind of like what I would call like a project manager. And the projects are all technical, they're software, applications, websites, and he has a portfolio of a bunch of different projects. One of his devs uh, went sideways and um, it did not end amicably between the two. So he's left in the precarious position of having to kind of salvage and maintain an application. And he has no idea how this thing works. So, you know, we got on a call. Um, he basically gave me keyboard and mouse. I went into his GCP instance. I found a VM. And I literally have no idea what's on this VM. So I, I SSH into the VM. I curl localhost. I find that he's got some flavor of WordPress running. I kind of figure out where the primary files are located. I restart Apache. We get it responding to localhost. Um, we set up uh, the, the domain on Google, and we got the website up and running, and that's fine. The problem is, what happens when the next bug emerges, when the next fire occurs? Um, you know, I had to really just direct him to Upwork and tell him that he'd have to get a freelancer. But my point with this discussion is, all of this is unnecessary. Like, he had a WordPress website, in effect yet he was running it on a virtual machine on GCP. And it's just, it's just this mismatch. It's, it's this total mismatch of um, identifying the right tool for the job. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about how he should be approaching projects like, he, like he's currently working on. And I'm gonna try to identify some of the issues that have been coming up with um, uh, with a lot of these consulting sessions that, I, that I'm having. And the problem, strangely enough, is, is not really a technical problem. The problem is clients not knowing what the state of the art is, like what the best off the shelf solution is for something. And we end up in this weird place where people are trying to cobble together like WordPress sites and like create MySQL servers and like really, they have no business doing so. So let us back up a little bit and talk about 
the landscape of modern software development. So we need to first recognize that a Fortune 1000 company has almost nothing in common with the common folk, you and I, who are maybe creating a project for uh, a client or uh, have our own startup idea even. You know, if I were to try to build an application, say, say I'm creating a Say I'm creating a website for a law firm. If I'm creating a website for a law firm in 2021, the answer is not web development. The answer is not MySQL databases. The answer is not PHP. The answer is low code, no code, off the shelf solutions. For that particular instance, out of the box web pages, I would use Webflow personally. And it I'm not pumping any tool tonight. I really don't care about the tool. It's the idea. The idea is that someone already solved the problem of spinning up aesthetically pleasing, low maintenance, no code solutions to standing up a website. And you know, that problem has been solved. You know, Webflow is one tool, but there's a million. There's, um, there's another one I like called UMSO. And actually, if you wanna be able to source, like what are the low code solution for a particular need or use case? Well, that's also been cataloged already. So there's a website called makerpad.com. Sorry, makerpad.co that this is what they do. It's a directory of these tools. And all you have to supply is your use case. Are you trying to build an app? Are you trying to build a website? Do you need a table? Do you need an email service? What do you need? So I could just come over to search here. And I could just search app. Ooh. I could search mobile app. All right, so the, the search is kind of, odd. So build an Airtable powered mobile app with Adalo. So I don't know what a dollar is. So this is a blog post. I thought it was going to give me like a category list of, of different products and, and we will find that, but there is a blog post and they're saying use a tool called a dollar. So if I come to a dollar, you can just take a look at this. Turn your amazing app concept into a reality without coding. So the problem I see with my peers is they, they're starting a startup or they have a new idea and they want to build their app from scratch. And it's just such a horrible idea. It's such a horrible idea. They should be using something like Adalo. And I don't even know this tool, but I already understand the gist of it in 10 seconds. What this does is this is a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get editor that lets you build your application and maintain it from a centralized UI, and it'll let you export your app to probably iOS, Android, and, and maybe Microsoft, and maybe even web. But it takes care of all the under the hood stuff, like the cross-platform compatibility. And that's exactly what you want. Why is that what you want? Because your app and your startup is not about reinventing React Native, or building another two-sided marketplace app, or building another XYZ app. It, it's not about that. It's about whatever is unique to your app. So you want to get as far as you can with off the shelf stuff until you get to that small um, region of new territory that is actually unique to your application. And then you focus on that. And that's where maybe you'd have to introduce some custom configuration or some custom coding. But my point is 95% of the work of building your app 
is um, is achievable through off-the-shelf solutions. The point is you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. When you try to reinvent the wheel, it ends up looking like this. It looks like this. Okay, and the point here is this is not effective. It doesn't work. And um, someone smarter than you created a elegant solution and people have agreed and come to consensus that this is the solution. This is what a wheel should look like. You know, maybe there's some like research or academic field that is focusing on how to improve the wheel and that's cool, but that's not you. So if we're gonna build a bicycle, we're just gonna use the tried and true method. And if we're gonna build an app, let's build what's new and novel to our idea and use off the shelf stuff for the rest of it. All right, so this is one little tool. Again, I, I don't know anything about this tool. Is this the best tool? I don't know. You have to do your research. The point is, the point is, let's look at two different routes you can go if you were presented to, if you were presented with a fork in the road. One is build the app from scratch, hire a developer. And the other is string together um, low code, no code, off the shelf solutions. First off, look at this pricing model. This is dirt cheap. This is dirt cheap. If you were to, like what does Adalo do? It spits out two native apps for you, iOS and Android. If you were to try to replicate that with your own engineer, do you know how much that would cost? What's, what's, the, what's the modern native framework, React Native? React Native is a framework that was built by Facebook I would say they keep uh, gaining ground on the native space. I know um, Google's framework uh, is putting a bid in as well, but if I were to guess, React Native is the primary uh, framework for uh, native development and trending framework, I would say, too. Okay, so React Native is uh, the kind of... Um, the framework that most native developers are using. So let's go to Glassdoor because we want say we wanted to hire a React Native developer. So let's just take a look here. Coming over to Glassdoor. And we're just gonna check out some comps here. So let's do uh, React Engineer, Salaries. Let's see what comes up here. Okay, so average base, average base salary for a React developer is $94,000. So, 94. All right, so for one dev, you can spend 8K and you probably won't get as much because they're only gonna get so far. So you can spend 8K a month for one dev or you can come to Adalo and use the pro plan for $50 a month. So, you know, the answer is fairly obvious there in my mind. Now, again, I, I have no ties or affiliations with Adalo. That's just the first thing that came up when I was looking through MakerPad. But let's check out some of the tools on MakerPad so you can get an idea. So that's one thing. Say you want to build a native app. Use one of these tools. Use one of these low-code, no-code tools. Um, and let's see what else. So yeah, they do it by tag here. So project management, productivity, automation, and this is probably the search that I should have used. So I don't know, web, Not sure what happened there. I guess I clicked autocode, which that's a very cool name for a company, we'll say. Um, no, let's just look in search and let's just look for a web. 
Okay. Webflow comes up. That was the one I was touting before. So, so if I'm trying, if I'm being freelance to build a website for um, that law firm that I'm talking about, I can build it from scratch, and I can I can create a virtual machine, and I can put it on Google Cloud Platform, and I could try to create a load balancer so that the GoDaddy domain points to the Google networking service, and the Google networking service points to my virtual machine. And as the site gets more traffic, I can scale up my virtual machines, and I'll create a pool of VMs, and uh, we'll have an instance group, and that'll be so much fun. I'll make sure the servers are always up. I'll make sure the databases have enough space. I'll make sure that's properly sized because, you know, if I have too many VMs, then the client's paying too much and they're not using it all. And we we want it to be sort of elastic. You know, that just sounds like a rat's nest. A rat's nest that I want nothing to do with. Which is why tools like Webflow are going to win. Like Zendesk uses them. Rakuten, Dell, Upwork. I bet you didn't know these very prominent companies whose needs far exceed yours, I'm sure are getting by just fine with low-code, no-code tools. And so you can focus on building the website and getting the content in there. You don't have to focus on scaling it. You don't have to focus on domains. You don't have to focus on hosting it. You don't even have to focus on like the latest framework. Webflow will take care and make sure it's on the newest framework. All you have to do is what is specific to your project, which in, which in, the, in this um, make-believe scenario would be branding, content, blog posts, UI, and that's pretty narrow. And so I think that makes a pretty compelling case for for low-code, no-code, no-code. And and just to keep in mind, like Webflow, Umso, Adalo, I think these ones are fairly new, but we all know about like the Squarespaces the Wixes. If I go to Crunchbase Wix, like just so folks know how mature this is, Wix is a public company now. Like this model has won. People need websites. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. But here's the thing. And this is what the the guy on the call today didn't understand. He was trying to understand like where does GCP fit in all this? And for that, for that and for the end user, for like the example of trying to spin up uh, an app, like as a startup, like not having millions of dollars of seed fund, not being like Walmart, Fortune 1000 company. If you wanted to spin up an app or spin up a website, GCP is not relevant in that conversation. Could you replicate what you could do on Wix on GCP? Of course. In fact, in fact, under the hood, Wix is doing cloud service. It's probably using AWS or Azure or GCP. But it's not relevant to the end user. And it's not ideal either. You know, where is GCP relevant in all this? Well, GCP has a ton of different products. And basically what I would say is you want to first see if there's low code, no code solutions for what you're trying to do. There won't always be. Like for instance, Google has introduced a lot of AI offerings and ML offerings. I don't think you're going to find low code, no code solutions uh, to support you there. So say for instance, let's just run through a little example here. So say I built my app using Adalo, and I find that I want my app to have face recognition as a feature. It's just, it's it's important for part of the app. Say it's like a dating app, and you need to be able to discern um, something about people's appearance, right? Well, first, you can't really code that from scratch. I mean, you can. But um, if you want to do that, you're going to be in a world of pain. Yeah, machine learning salaries. Let's see where those are at. So again, in this example, you want to hire someone to, or you want to incorporate face recognition. 
yeah, ML engineers. Yeah, they're commanding pretty decent salaries these days. So that's not a great uh, a great solution there. And you know, you might check out MakerPad, and you might not find anything. There's also another website. Uh, let's see here, no code. It's similar to MakerPad, but like different alliances. Um, it's called nocode.tech same idea it's a directory of low code solutions so say you find nothing that does face recognition which by the way you would find something like I know right off the bat that there are tools there's a tool called clarify how the heck do you spell that Clarify. World's AI starting building AI models. Yeah, they have like a glossary or a directory of models that do all sorts of things. Look, demographics, apparel detection, not safe for work, general models. And they're just an API. So so what I would do is it's it's low code, no code. It's not never code again. Code still has a place. The place is not reinventing the wheel. So whatever's unique, whatever's new, connections, right? So say I build my tool in Adalo. I mean, I build my app in Adalo and I want to add facial recognition. Adalo probably has a place where you can insert bespoke code or you can extend, like there's probably an API or an SDK that if you want to get your hands dirty, you probably can. And it's reserved for those small, narrow use cases that are not tackled by, you know, the um, uh, general offerings of, of the tool. So you would use that. You'd connect to the Clarify API, and now you'd have your new feature. You'd have face recognition. But let's say Clarify. Let's say there is no tool. Um, Google has Cloud Vision, Cloud Model APIs that can do similar things. And I will say GCP is, is probably the most sophisticated. Um, like you could train your own model on Google and then you could publish it as an API and then Adalo could reference it uh, through REST API. You know, that's where GCP might make sense. GCP would make sense if you're starting a startup and you have a seven figure seed round, a se seven figures of, of venture capital. Like if you're really going to have a go at creating a, a novel technology. Even in that case, actually, I would do the Eric Reese thing and I would like start out with something like you, you want to you want to bring these low code solutions to their limit. Right. Before you rework with something that like like you want to reach the, the local maxima before you have to rework everything to find the new global maximum, if that makes sense. So you don't start with hiring like a six figure developer to build your app from scratch. No, 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 no. You start as basic as possible with something like this. And if you're successful, if you're successful and you find that this company is no longer supporting you, well then, you can move on to um, maybe hiring that React to developer and starting to create your own tooling, your own libraries, your own code. But it's de-risked because you already had a go and had success using one of these other tools. And if you're gonna do that and, and you're able to command you know, enough venture capital to actually hire you know, six-figure developers, okay. Now you start exploring GCP and AWS. And, you, and then you start seeing what they have that makes sense for you. They're gonna have App Engine. They're gonna have ways to handle you know, higher scaled workloads and jobs, databases that scale. Um, they're gonna be able to take stuff off your plate uh, in a way that you will never have to revisit. Like it's, it's, it will be the final resting place um, for, for, for the solutions that you end up landing on. Um, 
All right, so, but okay, so we're talking about websites, we're talking about apps. Those are actually probably the most common use cases. But like, what else could you do with low code, no code? And the answer is you could do a lot. Like it's not just, it's not just the WordPresses and the web flows. Like let's go over to the tool directory here. Let's talk about data. Bubble. Build and host web applications without engineers. All right, that sounds like we already covered that. Create attractive interactive web apps from spreadsheets in minutes. That's cool. That's pretty cool to me. So many people working out of Excel. Um, macros going crazy. Um, let's come over to uh, the low code for a second. Where are you? No code, low code. All right, let's come over to tools. No code tool of the month. All right, so yeah, they break it up a little bit better here. So let's go to databases, Google Sheets. I ha I'd have to agree with this. Google Sheets is, everyone sleeps on Google Sheets. Google Sheets is huge. Airtable. Airtable's huge. I mean, Airtable, like the beauty of Google Sheets and Airtable is the sheet is the UI. The programming logic is um, the custom script that accompanies that sheet. But like I've seen the craziest uses of, of Airtable and Google Sheets. Um, there was this one company that I worked with uh, for a while, they're based out of Boston here, called Catch. And they were a great example of how to um, be strategic and use low code, no code. So basically, when I was talking with the founders of this company, what this company wanted to do is they wanted to create an app that recommends, that uses AI to recommend apparel options to their users. Um, so it's kind of like a recommendation engine um, that could uh, source the data from, from connecting to users like Instagram accounts and things like that and basically see what they liked and stuff like that. But the problem is they wanted to create an iOS, an Android, and a web app. And they just didn't know what they didn't know. And they were going to basically build it from scratch. I mean, they were going to hire a web development firm, six-figure project, to build that from scratch. Now, what they could have done is used Webflow plus Adalo, and that would be the next step for them. But they got even more Lean Startup-esque. Lean Startup says build the MVP, the minimum viable product. Like, What is the minimum that you can do to begin to validate your idea? And they really took that to heart. And this is what they did. So it's actually a chat bot that sends SMS to people. It sends you a text message. But what they were able to piggyback on was if you send someone a product, so let's just do like, um, I don't know, let's go to anthropology, because these are the type of uh, products that they're recommending, right? So say, you know, say their system wants to recommend this product to the user. Let's pull it up here. Um, all right, the floral maxi dress. So this is a skew in the anthropology catalog. And this is the, like they would be sourcing from multiple different um, distributors, multiple brands. But say this is a product that they want to send to one of their users as a recommendation. iMessage and SMS, especially on iPhone, is so sophisticated now that if you take this URL and you text it to someone, it doesn't just show up in plain text. It shows a preview. So it shows like the hero image in the carousel. It gives you the title of the product and it gives you the link. So they kind of ingeniously use that to their advantage. And so the system sends the link to the SMS number. And it does this with the Twilio API, by the way. Um, so it sends, it sends the product to the user through SMS. 
And then the user can train the model by liking, thumbs downing, hearting. That functionality is called tap back. And the server can get that information. So the server sends you a SKU for the floral maxi dress. You heart it, and now it feeds that back into the into the uh, the model for that user to create even better recommendations. And what were they able to do? They were able to circumvent that six figure. We need to go build apps for every platform project, and and they can still vet their idea and they can still get data. So, like this is. And you could even argue that this is better for the end user. Like, who wants to download another app? That just equals friction. And for this, you just sign up, give your number, and you're off to the races. So I love this approach. I love that they saved a bunch of money. And on the back end, they're using a bunch of uh, solutions strung together. Their database is BigQuery. BigQuery is just this amazing database here let's go over to it here so bigquery is a gcp product and basically it takes care of all the um all the maintenance around a database scaling um sharding replication all that stuff um takes care of all of that so um let's see here yeah, I don't have much to show you there, but basically it gives you um, it gives you a database that can scale indefinitely and you get this beautiful um, SQL, uh, GQL uh, syntax that you can use to traverse it. But also, say you don't know SQL, like even I'm not fluent with SQL. You can hook BigQuery to Google Sheets, their first class integrations. Why? Because they're both Google products. You can hook BigQuery to Google Data Studio. Why? Because they're all Google products. And BigQuery just has these kick-ass APIs. So like when Twilio is getting the tap back data as a response um, in the server, it's able to say, oh, okay, Tim liked the floral maxi dress. Let's send that data back to BigQuery. And then when we're creating a model, using you know presumably one of the GCP products well all the um, auto ML uh, computer vision AI models on GCP have a first class integration with bigquery because that's one of the primary places they expect you to have your data so there's an awesome synergy to be had um, and then where were they sourcing their products right like how do they know what products to recommend to users well Rakuten. Rakuten is a retail um, uh, aggregation platform, essentially. And they had an account on Rakuten and they just sign up, they create affiliate agreements with all the brands and Rakuten has an API. So I say, I say, you know, I, I gave them the feedback that I like the floral maxi dress, right? Well, maybe they can infer that, okay, Tim likes dresses. Maybe over time they see the pattern or, or Tim likes floral. Well, now when they're interfacing with the API to serve up new products, you make a Twilio makes a request to Rakuten and says, hey, get me dresses with floral patterns. They come back. You know, I run the, AI, the, the recommendation model. There's a, a rank ordered list of things that I might like and I send back, you know, the first five or something like that. There's still code in all this. Like you still need an engineer in all this, but you're getting by with such a narrow amount of code and you're leveraging. People don't realize like the power of synergies. You need to be getting ROI on ROI on ROI. You need to be riding the coattails of someone else who made an upfront investment. Like Rakuten already did a bunch of work. GCP already did a bunch of work. iMessage, they did a bunch of work to be able to beautifully render URLs. Like how can we find a synergy between all these things? Instead of like, oh, we're gonna go off on our own. We're gonna carve a new path. No, you're just gonna blow six figures on something that's not gonna work. That's all you're gonna do. Like if you come up with an MVP 
and you become so successful that the MVP no longer is adequate, that is a good place to be. Don't worry about that. That's exactly where you want to be. Because what you can do is you could take your MVP to investors at that point and say, hey, we have the data to substantiate a demand here, or we just have the data that's valuable in its own right. Again, ROI on ROI. And you got to be riding the work from other companies, in my opinion. And that's what people don't get. You know, these people, they have ideas for startups and they think that they have to build everything from scratch. And I think that's a losing strategy in 2021. Hot take, I recognize that. But, you know, that's that's the way things are going. So, I don't know, I guess the last thing I just want to talk about is where does GCP fit in all this? Where does AWS fit in this? And I talked about it a little bit. You know, they might offer something that's not offered elsewhere, particularly on the AI front. But there's still a place for, for GCP. Like, let's talk about let's talk about the example I just gave. You still need a server to you still need a way to like run automated jobs, for instance. Like say 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 you decide um, you want to send out the recommendations once a day. And there's gonna be just a function. It's just a function. It doesn't you don't need VMs, you don't need Ver, uh, server software. It's just, just a function that runs at a set interval and what it does is it, it runs your recommendation and maybe sends you a text of the top five products for the day. Well, Google actually has a really good solution for that. They have something called Cloud Scheduler. Cloud Scheduler is a way to run a function on an automated schedule doesn't do everything it doesn't it doesn't um, govern what the function is this is just the scheduling portion so I would use cloud scheduler to set up a job that runs daily and then you need the place to execute the function and again I'm not doing VMs um, that's way too low level I want to use cloud function for that I just want an ephemeral function that when called upon will run, has the ability to interface with third party APIs, right? So it might need to talk to Rakuten real quick. It might need to talk to the AI model to get the recommendations real quick. It might need to talk to a couple disparate services, but it's a concise function that uses maybe Node.js. I'm partial to Node.js, could be Python, really doesn't matter. And you would use cloud function for that. So now you've got two tools. You've got cloud scheduler, cloud function. And that's your back end. That's your entire back end. Maybe you find you need more. Like you probably need the networking solutions. Like if you wanted a, a proper API host name or something like that. Okay, fine. But there's no like load balancing. There's no scaling. Scaling isn't even a thing. It shouldn't be a thing. Unless you're like Facebook and you like directly compete with GCP or like you're Walmart and can't use AWS, right? Like Walmart has to go off on their own and create their own data centers. They just have to. Like what are they gonna use, AWS? Facebook, what are they gonna use, Google? So like there are companies that have to do that and that's fine. And as a byproduct of their work, like when Facebook goes off and builds its own apps, there are byproducts of that work that us common folk will use. And that's what React Native is. Like we talked about React Native or we talked about React. React is just a byproduct of Facebook's tooling over time that they open sourced because they recognized it had value beyond them. That's all it is. So I say, let the researchers, let the academics, let the FANG, you know, top computing companies take care of research. Research. Research is like new knowledge. Like how should we do face recognition? That's a researcher question. That's an academic question. How can my app use face recognition? 
that's an engineering question Be, um, because I'm going to that's an information systems question how is my system going to connect with this other system not how am I going to architect new machine learning models to tackle a problem that's basically already been solved no 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 we don't want that so anyways like cloud computing is still important but you got to know where that demarcation is between something we can get off the shelf problem that's already been solved that's been made cheap made a commodity and novel new unique coding that needs to be done for our enterprise so the key thing is when you, when a, a new use case arise, arises for your product for your project you got to do some research to find what's out there and if you're really smart maybe you'll find stuff that's not out there but that other companies are working on that has a synergy with what you're doing and you can reach out to them and say hey like would you make this available to us on some sort of you know contractual basis what company doesn't want a marginal revenue stream exactly so again don't reinvent the wheel don't start from scratch if you reinvent the wheel it's going to look like that bike i was showing you and you're not a hero okay like you're not a martyr for like rebuilding databases um it is a herculean effort but you will not be rewarded in kind you're just going to end up with this thing right here and no one wants this so anyways that is all i have for this stream tonight and i hope this was informative i am going to continue beating this drum and this will not be the last that we hear about low code no code anyways have a good night